In 1918, a tiny, silent killer ravaged the world. Bioterrorism on a horrifying scale. And, and it was just like the Black Death. It just went around the world and you wiped out thousands and thousands of people. The 1918 influenza was extremely virulent. Um, probably uh, the worst infectious disease outbreak ever recorded. The Spanish flu spread faster and killed more people in less time than any of the great plagues of history. It moved so fast that by the time people realized what was happening, it had gone on to the next state, the next, uh, the next province. It didn't seem to matter if you were totally isolated. In the middle of the Arctic, you could still get it. And who could explain this, I don't know. There was no cure and no explanation for why it came so suddenly and killed so fast. Now, well, that was one of the mysteries. How is this thing spreading? It just seemed to be coming out of nowhere and going and being everywhere at once. Then, just as quickly, it was gone. And to this day, the Spanish influenza is still one of the great murder mysteries of the 20th century. March 11, 1918, Fort Riley, an American forces base in Kansas. A company cook reports to the base hospital with what seems to be typical symptoms of the flu. Mild fever, sore throat, and muscle aches. By noon, there are 100 more cases. Within a week, 500. Military camps are hotbeds of uh, respiratory infectious viruses, again, for the same reason that you bring uh, people together and you put them in close uh, quarters, say open barracks, in which uh, everyone, uh, 300 men are sleeping in one open room, so one person sneezes, everyone gets the virus. Within a matter of days, there are other outbreaks. Thousands of workers at the Ford Motor Company in Detroit are sent home with the same symptoms. In California, 500 prisoners at San Quentin come down with the flu, but still no alarm bells. And there's no pr precedent for it. If you say plague, everybody says, my God, plague. If you say influenza, everybody says, huh? No, not to worry, it's influenza. Take an aspirin and go to bed. But there's something different about this flu. People are not only getting sick, they're dying. That spring, 46 soldiers are buried at Fort Riley. It seemed like somebody would, would get, start to feel a little bit ill, and then hours or maybe a day later, they couldn't breathe. Their, their skin would turn dark because they couldn't get enough oxygen to their blood, and they would essentially drown. Their, lung, their lungs would fill with fluid. Then, just as quickly as it arrived, the sickness seems to disappear. The First World War is raging in Europe. And that summer, tens of thousands of American soldiers are crowding onto troop ships for the voyage overseas. 
no one realizes that many are carrying something far deadlier than their weapons, a tiny, silent stowaway. I don't think anybody's ever figured out the numbers, but certainly there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, soldiers who died on those ships who might well have survived if they'd just been left wherever they were. I've been on a troop ship and it was stacked six high in the bunks. I can't imagine the worst place to be with a respiratory disease. Within weeks, the Fort Riley sickness surfaces among the combat troops in the trenches. The virus passes first from the Americans to the British, French, and Commonwealth troops, and then effortlessly crosses no man's land to infect the German army. So you bring a virus that's infectious from one person to another into populations where people are stressed and then severely crowded. They're crowded on troop ships, they're crowded in trenches, they're crowded in barracks. Uh, and so you have the virus can just really efficiently spread from person to person. So entire companies, entire armies would come down with the flu within just a couple of days. In no time, the virus has jumped the channel into Britain and crossed the mountains into Italy. When it arrives in Spain, the epidemic is reported in the public press for the first time. In a strange twist of history, this is what gives the flu its name. In Europe, nobody was talking about it because of wartime secrecy. But Spain was unaligned at that time, and they were, they, they just, it was reported. So people said, oh, there's this Spanish flu, because that was like the only country that was admitting they had it. And of course, Spain had influenza just like everybody else did, but publicized it let the world know about it. So by the process of elimination, the poor Spaniards got uh, hung, this title hung around the neck of the Spanish flu. As it spreads through Europe, the virus mutates, grows stronger and more deadly. What we had in 1918 was an influenza virus that was uh, extremely fit, and by that I mean that all of the proteins of the virus worked extremely well together, that the virus was extremely well tuned to, to be infectious to people, to be highly transmissible, to go from person to person, and to replicate and make copies of itself at very high copy number, very deep in the lung. But this new enemy is overshadowed by the fighting in Europe. North America is preoccupied with recruiting drives and bond rallies to feed the war effort. In the late summer of 1918, sick and wounded troops begin returning to North America. Many carry inside them a tiny killer, unlike anything the world has ever seen. At military camps all over North America, men begin dropping like flies. When you read what they said, it was, it was so chilling, you almost couldn't believe it. They described in a Camp Devons, which was near Boston, one of the first places where the flu showed up, that the body, people were dying so fast that you couldn't even get into the morgue. The bodies were stacked like cordwood, and you had to step over the bodies just to get in. They said it took special trains to carry away the dead. At some camps, soldiers in the prime of life are dying at the rate of 100 a day. One anonymous doctor at Camp Devons is overwhelmed by the carnage. These men start with what appears to be an attack of la grippe, or influenza. And when brought to the hospital, they very rapidly develop the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. We used to go down to the morgue and look at the boys laid out in long rows. It beats any sight they ever had in France after a battle. Medical science has worked wonders on other killer diseases, smallpox, anthrax, and meningitis. But against this epidemic, it is helpless. No one understands what causes it, how it spreads, or how to stop it. They didn't know what the hell was going on. 
they uh, didn't know uh, anything about uh, about viruses. They were looking for a needle in a haystack. They didn't know there was a needle, and they didn't know what a haystack was. So uh, they spun their wheels uh, uh, wildly. Nothing worked. It was one of those things that just sort of was spreading like wildfire so quickly no one could even understand how it was doing it. Most doctors conclude incorrectly that the culprit is bacteria. All they know for certain is that whatever it is, it attacks the most unlikely victims and kills them quickly. Young, healthy 25-year-olds, 30-year-olds would get the flu and then die in just a couple of days. And the way they died was actually extremely unusual and not typical of influenza viruses in general. What happened is that their lungs would basically fill with edema fluid or blood, and they would literally drown in their own fluid or blood, uh, often uh, in as early as one or two days after the onset of symptoms. The virus has swept through the military population on both sides of the Atlantic, but in September 1918, the killer flu drifts out of the army camps and is loose in the world. By the fall of 1918, Spanish influenza has rounded the globe in just four months and goes from epidemic to pandemic. It has already killed tens of thousands of people in its first wave. Now it returns to North America with greater fury. It arrives in Canada in September, hitting the big port towns first. The first civilian outbreak was in a college in uh, Quebec, Victoriaville. And two of the boys became ill and followed immediately after by 398 more. So the, the poor uh, the heads of the school were at a complete loss. And they shipped them all off across the province if they were well enough to stand. And presumably they carried the flu germ with them. In a matter of weeks, flu is everywhere across the province. Thousands of cases crowd the hospitals, infecting nurses, doctors, and other patients. In Montreal alone, the flu kills more than 3,000 people. I can remember very, very clearly, for example, at that time, when the flu, that the people seemed to be dying all over the place. I, I mean, death seemed to be very commonplace. Tom Kieran's was only five years old when the flu hit Montreal, and every day on his street there were two or three funerals. But I can remember playing with my, my cousin, and, uh, and suddenly I was told that he was dead and he was going to be buried. Returning soldiers, some of whom had survived four years on the battlefields of the Great War, now fall prey to an unseen killer. Geraldine Wakeley's grandfather is one of them. He came back here uh, to work. He was an orderly, I guess, in the hospital, to, helping to take care of these men. And uh, he, he just picked up this disease from the men he was taking care of. By the time her grandmother goes to see him in the hospital, he is already deathly sick. When he went in the hospital, I don't think he expected to come out, because he wrote a, a will at that time, willing his farm in Ontario to his uh, wife. And uh, he'd never, he never saw her again. He, he told her not to come back, because people were dropping dead in the streets, and he didn't want her there with the children. Eight days later, her grandfather is dead. There was this terrible irony of uh, servicemen who, who had 
experienced just appalling conditions during the war and dreadful wounds and came home and got flu and died. Now that, that was the ultimate irony, wasn't it? In Halifax, the epidemic is being fueled by the war effort. American troop ships en route to Europe stop here to unload thousands of soldiers too sick to make the crossing. They fill the local hospitals and further spread the flu virus. I remember Father coming home one day and he said, I think we're in for trouble. There is a lot of bacteria that they figure has come in on some ships during the wartime and it's incubated here and it's been other places on the seaboard. Every member of Eleanor Ellison's family catches the flu that fall, but they are luckier than most, and all survive. I thought I was going to die. I really did. I've had flu since that, and I can't explain it to you, but the fever was different. It engulfed you, it from head to foot. You just were burning up absolutely burning up and nothing I can remember mother changing my nightgown several times in the run of the day quarantine signs begin to appear on front doors all over Halifax I looked up and down the street and it Practically everybody on the street was quarantined because it was highly contagious. But nothing seems to stop or even slow the spread of the deadly virus. It is so contagious that even the most isolated communities are not immune. The sickness comes to the native village of Okak on the Labrador coast on a supply boat. The Harmony was um, one of the uh, uh, ships that came from Europe with uh, supplies, and she had brought a, a supply of, uh, I guess, the things people would need for the winter and had left late in the fall. And apparently the, the story that my mother told me was that there was somebody sick on that uh, ship on the Harmony, and uh, this is where they think that... Uh, the flu came from, from England. It took only a few hours to unload the stores and it was gone. But that crewman had left something else behind. Influenza flashes through the village in a matter of days. Beatrice Watt's mother often told her the story of what happened in the remote native village. She told us about uh, how she woke up one morning and uh, her stepfather was lying by the stove. We, he had been out bringing in wood to, to light the, the fire. And uh, she spoke to him, but he didn't respond. He just didn't move. Then she ran to her mom. Her mother was still in bed, uh, sleeping. And she said she called to her mother to tell her mother that her uh, stepfather was just lying there. She didn't know what was wrong with him. And when she touched her mom, her mom didn't move. She, uh, she had died in her sleep, and she still had the baby, her youngest baby, my mother's youngest brother, on her breast. <laughs> And then so she said she uh, took the baby away. She was only nine years old and, and uh, took the baby away from her mother and bundled him up and, and she ran to her grandmother's to tell her grandmother about her stepfather and her mom. Just as she was getting to her grandmother's house, they were bringing her grandmother out, dead, and one of her aunts. In the village of 330 people, 280 die of the flu. 
Reverend Walter Parrott, a Moravian missionary, keeps a diary. What had been a happy and prosperous village was in a few days wiped out. Whole families died without being able to send for help. One little girl, the only survivor in a household, lived on in solitude with her dead parents and brothers and sisters around her. For weeks, she lived like this. The flu flashes through native villages all over Labrador. Reverend Henry Gordon, another missionary, harnesses a team of sled dogs to bring food supplies to the isolated settlements. Paradise, once the largest settlement in the bay, is a veritable city of the dead. Many of the people are still sick, not a sign of life to be seen anywhere. The first place I made for was Mountaineer Cove. There were once four families living there. I found the remains of one. All the rest were dead. Edward Pardee is one of five children Reverend Gordon found orphaned in one of the houses. Mother was uh, across the house, born, born a baby across the river. She was born a baby across the river. And then she come back, there was Sunday, come back, no, Saturday. Sunday she come back, come back Sunday, and she got back 12 o'clock in the night. And, uh, She come in and she lay, laying on the table. When she laying on the table, she fell back, fell back on the floor of bed. Yeah. So I just click her down. So, uh, those men up the river come down and, and put her up in the porch. She said, boys, be good to your father. She said, that's the best word I heard her say. Yeah. We never had a chance to give you a good for a father. It cost six months, six, six hours after he died, you see. Never forget. Never. Together, the survivors and the missionary take on the awful task of burying the dead. The frozen ground and their own weakness prevented the digging of graves. They buried the bodies in the sea through a grave-like hole cut in the ice and set fire to the deserted houses to get rid of the infection. In a grisly turn of events, the survivors are forced to destroy hundreds of sled dogs. With no one left to feed them, they have begun to run in savage packs. They just went wild, dashed through the windows of the houses, and pulled down the doors, and fell to eating human flesh. In some cases, they attacked the living, who were not strong enough to beat them off. In just two weeks, the Spanish flu had wiped out one-third of the Inuit population in Labrador. The village of Okak is abandoned and never resettled. People didn't seem to want to go back there, although it was a really good place for, for hunting and fishing and, you know, to, for making a living and just surviving, I guess. Um, nobody wanted to go back. They just uh, closed it down and left it. By October 1918, virtually every town and village in North America is under siege. They begin to look like ghost towns. Afraid to venture out, people shut themselves in their houses, and businesses are forced to close their doors. Theaters suffered, and schools, even churches. Uh, there was one point where um, where the Roman Catholic priest in, I think this was in Montreal, walked along the street and blessed people. 
because they were not able to meet in one big place. In Montreal, the flu is killing people at the rate of 165 a day. In Toronto, a special trolley car is adapted to carry coffins to the cemetery because the hearses can't keep up. In Philadelphia, 700 people die in a single day in October. Victor Vaughn, the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army, concludes. If the epidemic continues its mathematical rate of acceleration, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth in a matter of weeks. By October 1918, the Spanish flu is spreading with breathtaking speed across the Atlantic Ocean and through North America. Canadian soldiers stand a better chance of surviving the trenches of the Western Front than surviving an attack of the flu. At one point, there were 10,000 servicemen sick here and something like 49,000 in, in Britain, some enormous number. And the people who, uh, who nursed them took over schools and convents as temporary places. And they said sometimes they could hardly get along the rows between the cots. To the doctors and nurses, it is an enormous murder mystery. They cannot understand how it spreads and why this particular flu is so lethal. Most of those who died, the majority were people who got secondary uh, bacterial infections uh, and would take 10 days, 10 days, two weeks to, uh, to die. But there were a very significant number uh, of people who would, uh, on Tuesday, come down with the disease and Thursday be dead. And most disturbing is the flu's choice of victims. Usually, influenza kills the very old and the very young, but not this time. There are a lot of people who die of flu every year, but they are not young, healthy people. And that's one of the mysteries of the flu. Why would it kill the young and the healthy? And, and, not, and of course, it also hit its usual victims, but the big, the big group that were dying were the young and the healthy. Medical science is handicapped by 1918 technology. Viruses are unknown, and microscopes are too crude to see them. Most doctors conclude it is a bacterium that causes the flu, but they are fighting the wrong enemy. I think that what you have is a virus that spreads very efficiently person to person through uh, respiratory spread, that is, little droplets of water that are uh, coughed out or sneezed out of one person and breathed in to another person. And these viruses spread very efficiently no matter what. <laughs> The medical community is grasping for solutions to a problem it cannot understand. Faced with an inexplicable killer, governments at every level are in chaos. They have no answers, but they must do something, anything. Uh, there weren't any vaccines, there weren't any cures. Uh, and uh, the only things that they could come up with were uh, absurd, like wearing gauze masks. Um, shutting down the schools uh, and churches so people wouldn't breathe on each other. I saw pictures of whole schools and staffs of banks and insurance companies, everyone wearing a mask. It was quite ghostly looking. In Canada, a federal department of health does not even exist yet. Provinces and municipalities take matters into their own hands. Some ban public meetings of any kind. Others impose fines or jail terms for sneezing or spitting in the street. Every day there are rumors of some new wonder cure, and hucksters prey on people's fears to sell everything from galoshes to Ovaltine. There's a... Uh a commercial reaction to any sort of a crisis. And uh, 
Urban medications were, were uh, produced and peddled that were, you know, guarantee you uh, recovery from the disease or you won't even uh, get the disease and they were all absolutely and totally useless. Equally worthless are the dozens of folk remedies that circulate. Bags of mothballs or camphor worn around the neck, goose grease, castor oil or turpentine. They sprinkled sulfur in their shoes. They carried uh, pans of sulfur through the house, lit. Uh, that was to purify the air. And some people said uh, a salt herring tied around the throat would cure. They mixed sulfur with molasses and made sulfur and molasses kind of a, a light yellow colored that tasted pretty good. And actually, you could eat that with a, in a, with a spoon or, or, or a piece of bread. Another remedy that uh, I was told about was uh, about dipping a needle into the scent gland of a skunk and stirring the needle around in a glass of water and drinking the water. But nothing slows the epidemic. By mid-October, the flu has spread from east to west, cutting a swath through North America. Buildings everywhere are commandeered, and university auditoriums, schools, church basements become temporary hospital wards. In Toronto, ribbons begin appearing on the front doors of houses all over the city. A gray sash for the loss of an adult, white for the death of a child. It was a very random thing. It might uh, uh, hit one house in a city block and no others, or it might take almost all the houses. Uh, hearses went up and down the streets, and one woman talked about uh, hearing the cart rattling at night. It sounded sort of like the French Revolution. Uh, uh, they were carrying away the, the dead. In some places, the death toll rises so fast that bodies must be buried in mass graves. One observer writes, the fear was so thick that even a child could feel it. Every day there was someone we knew in the obituary columns. We got so we didn't even mourn. Armistice Day, November 11th, 1918. A sense of relief sweeps over the world as news comes that the Great War is finally over. All over North America and Europe, there are victory parades and celebrations in the streets. I can remember, five years old, looking from our top veranda on the third floor at 195 Laporte Avenue, looking down on the street. And my mother and my Aunt Lena, both young women, relatively young women at the time, uh, linking their arms and dancing together in the street. There was such joy that the war at last was over. But there is no peace in the war against the flu. In November 1918, in Ontario alone, another 3,000 people die from the virus. One woman remembers uh, at the end of the war, Armistice Day. It was so much celebration. And her, uh, her mother and four of her brothers and sisters had been ill with flu. On the day of the celebration, she and her father were at the graveside of her mother. They could hear the bells ringing. And she found this very, very hard to, to take. It is a cruel irony that the armistice actually speeds the spread of influenza. 
People ignore the ban on public gatherings, rush into the streets and hug and kiss, infecting each other. Canadian soldiers are coming home at the rate of 3,500 a month. As they fan out across the country, the silent killer travels with them. Men coming from the, off the ships, but uh, very often they maybe didn't have active flu, but they were incubating it. So if they got to, say, say they got to Winnipeg, get off the train, everybody was so happy to see them, and then they'd go into the city and spread it around. The epidemic spreads west following the rail lines. Some towns refuse to allow the trains to stop. Others order health inspectors to check passengers before they're permitted into the station. But still the flu spreads. Through the prairies in Alberta, across the Rockies, all the way to the Pacific coast. You can protect yourself from either AIDS or Ebola. You have to be in direct contact with body fluids. And we know how to prevent them. We know how to protect ourselves from them. And with tuberculosis too, you can, you can quarantine the sick and you can prevent the spread of it. There's no way that anybody could think of to prevent the spread of this flu. So-called flu vaccines begin to appear on the market and thousands of people rush to their doctors to get inoculated. But the injections are the product of nothing more than guesswork. I uh, talked to a doctor in San Francisco, a man in his 80s, who was uh, producing vaccines and putting them in people's arms in 1918. And he cheerfully told me, I asked him what was in it. He said it was a soup. We took sputum and uh, <laughs> you know, strained it and uh, punched it into people's arms. People's arms got really hurt, uh, which was encouraging because you knew something had been done. But the vaccines are no more effective than the gauze masks and home remedies. About all society can do is bury the dead and care for the sick. Thousands of volunteers offer their help to meet what seems an endless demand. Any, any woman who could help by changing beds, doing laundry, cooking, whatever, was asked to come forward. And there were wonderful breakdowns of the social barriers. There were matrons who had never come any closer to household duties than telling their cooks what to do or instructing their maids suddenly found themselves changing beds and feeding people, and washing floors. It was quite remarkable. By Christmas 1918, the hospitals are overflowing. Temporary treatment shelters are full, and health officials are at their wits' end. Then, just as it seems nothing can stop the flu, it begins to retreat on its own. Towns and cities begin to see a sharp decline in the number of cases, and newspapers report that death rates are dropping dramatically. Doctors are as perplexed by its departure as they were by its arrival. At the 1918 influenza was a big medical mystery. Here was the largest influenza pandemic in history, possibly the worst infectious disease outbreak of all human history, with about 40 million deaths, 500 million cases. And yet no one knew anything about the virus directly. It will be another decade and a half before medical researchers discover the flu virus. But in 1918, all anyone can understand clearly is the carnage it has caused. 50,000 Canadians have died, nearly as many as have been killed during the whole of the First World War. In the United States, so many die from the flu that for 1918, the average life expectancy drops by 13 years. They killed more Americans than died in battle in World War I, World War II, Korea and Vietnam combined. And one person at the time wrote something which I thought was really interesting. He said, 
that this virus demonstrated the inferiority of human weapons in destroying human life. Almost every country in the world has suffered. Half a million die in Russia, 375,000 in Italy, at least five million in India. It's estimated that the 1918 pandemic has killed at least 40 million people worldwide. But most experts agree the numbers are probably much higher. There's a lot of underestimation of uh, the number of deaths, uh, and particularly uh, understated uh, morbidity, morbidity uh, rates, which are always understated anyway because uh, a lot of people get the disease, have no sign of it at all. A lot of people get the disease and keep on cranking along uh, anyway, uh, but don't turn themselves uh, in as, as sick. So rule of thumb would be that uh, the uh, death rates and the uh, mor morbidity rates in 1918 are practically every place understated, not overstated. Even by conservative estimates, the 1918 influenza killed more people in a shorter period of time than any disease in history. And no one yet knows why it was so deadly. The records indicate there is another pandemic coming. The question is when. Medical researchers are still struggling to unravel the mystery of the 1918 influenza. It is not simply an academic exercise. Unless they can understand what happened in the past, they cannot prepare for the future. New influenza viruses will emerge, and I think it's very likely that new pandemic viruses will, will reappear. Since we don't yet know, one, where the 1918 flu came from, and two, why specifically it was so lethal, we can't apply those lessons to the future. In 1997, two separate scientific expeditions set out to find tissue samples containing genetic material of the 1918 virus. The first traveled to a remote island in Norway, where seven coal miners who died of the flu had been buried. Scientists were hoping their bodies might have been preserved in the permafrost. But unfortunately for this project, the, uh, the bodies had uh, slowly risen up during this 80-year period so that they were just below the surface of the ground. And because of that, they had uh, repeatedly uh, thawed and refrozen. And uh, so there were, there were no soft tissues remaining in these bodies, and so there was no, no way to recover uh, fragments of the virus. The second expedition to Alaska was luckier. Here, a retired pathologist, Johann Hulten, found the bodies of four Spanish flu victims that had been solidly frozen for 80 years. Tissue samples were taken from one of the bodies that still contained genetic material of the virus. But scientists are still a long way from unlocking the secret. But it's going to take us years because the virus uh, genetic material is broken up into these teeny tiny fragments and so we have to isolate each tiny fragment one at a time generate its sequence and then in a sense put the whole thing together like putting together a puzzle or a mosaic every year influenza causes 20,000 deaths in the United States alone but if a virus with the killing power of the 1918 flu appeared again the speed of modern travel would produce a devastating death toll. It isn't uh, ships that take a week to cross the Atlantic now and, and two weeks or whatever to cross the Pacific. You know, we're, we're hours away from any spot on the, on the globe uh, now. So if anything like this exploded again, it would uh, travel immensely fast. I ask people all the time, could it happen again? Because it's, it's, it's the question on everybody's mind. And the answer I always get is, yeah, it really could. You can't discount this. Because if you, flu viruses are always changing. That's why we have a new flu season every year. They're always mutating, and we're not the only species that gets infected. So they mutate other places, and they mix and match and scramble their genes. 
All the studies show severe flu epidemics break out on a regular cycle, and many scientists predict that the world is overdue for another attack. Uh, much of the world's population lives in conditions not significantly different than they were in 1918, so I think if an influenza pandemic of the magnitude of 1918 were to reoccur, I think that we would be looking at uh, very similar percentages of uh, illness and death, which is uh, uh, very depressing and uh, also very scary, it's a sobering thought. Influenza is so transmissible that it will sweep around the world uh, and, you know, it can, can do it again uh, tomorrow, it can do it again uh, uh, today. Uh, the only way to stop influenza from uh, moving across the world is people got to stop breathing or all crawl into holes and stay there, and that's not going to happen.